Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co, and today I'm reviewing Age of Rome from Teetotum Game Studios. And Age of Rome is a game in which you're going to be dealing with a bit of worker placement as you build out a variety of cities, cities that you never really maintain ownership or control over as they rotate around the board, as the various board situations and the board states become other players, the things you build this round become other players next rounds. Across nine rounds of play, you're going to go ahead and resolve a sequence of play where you pull a scheme card, which is going to determine how the board rotates. The board can rotate in any of the directions or even going directly to the other side. It's also going to give you a bit of an effect that often gives someone who has the least of something some sort of reward. And then from there, you're going to start going through a building phase where you're going to spend money in order to build a whole bunch of buildings on the board. This is where these stacks of acrylic buildings are going to come into play as you gather the various buildings, looking at the various costs of the five core buildings. There's a whole bunch of regions on the board. Don't let that overwhelm you. Each region is basically a duplicate of one another. So you have five building spots, five types of buildings, three levels of each building within those types. And each one has a cost to it and a number of points is going to give you along the point track. Points that are just as important in-game as they are end-game because as you move up the point track, you're going to slowly unlock more workers, more people you can place, more workers you can use. So as you move up the track slowly but surely, as you cross one of these markers over here, this marker is going to move down, making it slightly easier for the next person to get to that same spot. And you're going to unlock a new worker that you can use as you go into the next round. You see, once you're done building out the building, once everyone, all the players have in turn order built at the very buildings in their region, adding more to the game, adjusting the population track on their dials, population track that will come into play in terms of the income phase when you get income based on the population. From there, once the buildings are set and every round they're going to be constantly being, being built on and added more and more across nine rounds, uh, what starts off with nothing on the board is slowly going to progress to having level two and three buildings in all the spots on the board. But once you're done with that building phase, you move to the worker placement phase, where again, in turn order, and that could change the direction every round based on this card. From there, you're going to go ahead and start placing down your workers on these buildings and or in this spot over here or placing schemes on the board in order to get what you want out of the game. The five buildings each give you a core action, a different way that they move you forward in scoring victory points in the game. You're going to have your military regions over here where you place your military units down over here. You're going to have your senate over here, your form that you're slowly building out, your personal forms, which will score you chunks of points depending on how you build them or who gets there first, so to speak. You're going to have the politics where you start voting in the senate or trying to gain control and trying to get extra chunks of points whenever you're able to lock in a three-spot majority in a row, you'll get extra points there. You're going to have the farm, which gives you just, well, money. It gives you a little bit of extra money, which money can be used to build more buildings which gives you more points keeping your engine running and then lastly you have navigation over here where you're going to go ahead and grab trade cards from this deck of cards trade cards that both have a degree of set collection in the game as you try to gather various sets of cards get three of a kind and you get a chunk of points at the end of the game alternatively all the cards also have abilities abilities that can be triggered in one way or another when things are done against you when you place a worker when different things happen these cards will give you different abilities and or set collection those five core actions are going to be the, co the core idea of what you're doing with your workers and the strength of a building determines how many workers you can place down on that building each round which is important because you're only ever activating in your region and so if you want to go ahead and lock in that that senate majority over here it will help if you have additional actions in the senate that you can take so you can get in a few extra points at once you have the right turn in the right situation you can score nine points in a single turn from the senate over here possibly even more depending on how things are set up but you can get you can get a lot of things cascading very nicely depending on how you set up your actions, how many actions you can take around, and how many citizens, how many workers you have to go ahead and place on those spots. Additionally, the last spot you really have is the idea of schemes in the game. Schemes are going to be this other aspect where you kind of block other players. It's a little bit of a targeting the leader, taking them down, or you can do it against anyone really, but generally I recommend the leader, where you basically set a scheme in motion in your zone, and as the board rotates around the board, as it goes to another player, they now have their schemes and your schemes in their zone, and you can go ahead and doing the, the event phase, the scheme phase, you can activate your schemes against them, doing one of your abilities against them. You can ding them a point, or depending on which character you have, there's a bunch of characters in the game, depending on which character you have, you can activate different schemes against those players, are targeting their buildings, knocking out their votes, different things, ejecting them from the little area control fighting down here. Do that, rinse and repeat across the nine rounds of play and then score for end game points. End game points are going to come down from the regions over here, they're going to come down from the way you have areas in the Senate, they're going to come down from a variety of your set collection and a few other aspects, they're going to come down from the giant chunks of buildings you've been building over here, whole bunch of different ways 
you can get points at the end of the game in addition to the points you've earned during the game. There's a few other small things that I haven't touched upon. Things like the first player to building a third a third level building will get one of these majority markers. These, uh, I can't remember what they're called. They're called the... the I don't remember what they're called, but these markers, you got these markers over here that will give you their own different benefits on them. Things like, for instance, normally when you achieve a majority in the Senate, you get two points. But if you're the person who got there first, you'll get three points every time you've done so, which can lead to you having more of a motivation or incentive to constantly build up those buildings in all the regions. So no matter how the board spins, you're able to capitalize on that. So it gives you these little things over here. The cards, we haven't heavily gone into the exact way they sequence out, but basically, like I said already, they have abilities, they have set collection. We haven't heavily gone into every small nuanced aspect, but at a high level we've covered most of what this game does. The income phase is an important one. Do every single round during the income phase, you're going to get points equal to your region's population. Your population is going to be one plus the number of buildings you've slowly built across the board. A number includes the level of buildings. But then additionally, you always have the option to pay points to get double your income. So as you move this marker, it's going to slowly adjust. So like right over here, we have seven income. But if I want, I can pay five points to get 14 income instead of seven. I can double my income, but at the cost of five points, is it worth it? Is it not? Well, it depends what you do with that money. It depends how you use that money to earn these extra markers, locking in a level three building before other players thought you were ready. In terms of what buildings you build, what actions you're going to take. There's a lot of things you can do, but giving up five points is costly. Is it worth it? Is it a trade-off there? Those are all decisions you'll have to make as you play Age of Rome, which is a good time to tangent into the review part of things. Starting off with ease of play. The rules for Age of Rome were frankly long, but also they were very um, example and image heavy. So while they're wrong, I don't think this is actually a very hard game to learn. or It's a fairly easy game to teach as well. There's a few small nitpicks as far as different things. Like the schemes are a little fiddly in the way those interact. But I would say most aspects of the game are fairly easy to get people up and running past a few minor fiddly aspects. Now understanding the game is a different story. I find players need a round or two before they start to really understand things and the way the way you have to go for things, the, the income or the points you're going to give up in order to get extra income, trying to lock in these over here. Some of those aspects, some of the, some of the strategic aspects need to be explained more than just the rules. The rules alone, fairly easy to get people up and running. Game time is a little bit of a mix though. Game time, I've had, I think my shortest game was with three players under an hour for the full game, but my longest game was with four players drifting closer to three hours. I think the game time on this one does range fairly heavily, both based on player count, as well as based on how people, how well people understand the game and how how quickly they're diving into it, how fast they're taking their actions. There could be a lot of slow downtime as players ask questions, clarify things, think through their actions. Or if you have people who know the game, it's just place, 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 place fairly quickly. So I have seen a decent range on the play time. I don't know where this will settle at, but I would say expect a, you know, more two to three hour experience initially. And as you understand the game or as you're playing with people who know it better, I think it does pick up and pace fairly quickly. As far as player count, this is a one to four player game. I've only played this one at three and four players. I've not tried this at one or two players. I don't even know the solo mode, uh, but as far as two players haven't tried it there, I imagine my opinion of two would be similar to my opinion of three, which is that playing with three players, I enjoyed the game. I had fun with it. It was, a, it was a good experience. No real complaints in terms of the interaction of three versus player, three versus four. And in fact, because of that downtime aspect, you can have a faster game at three players. But what I will say is that three players has this interesting aspect where you could have a region that's not getting love and attention. That first round, you're going to have three players who are building up their regions and another player who's not building up region because they're not there. And so as the board turns, suddenly somebody doesn't really have a built out region. These tiles over here, these buildings are not really present. And so at that point, you're now trying to build out a region from scratch, depending on how the board turned. Now, it's not inherently a bad thing because very often you get a better return or ratio of our, as far as how much money you have to spend versus how many points you get back. So it's not necessarily a bad thing inherently to be walking into a region that isn't developed. But as the game progresses, it can be a bad thing. As the game progresses, the chances of you winding up with a region where you can't build that third level building, it, it can be more of an issue. I would say that my, my overall opinion is I'm not prepared to confidently speak as to the balance of how that third empty region really works out. But I will say it always feels like it has the potential to be a drop off. So it's more of a niggling concern in the back of my head as opposed to, oh my gosh, this is broken at three players. I'd love to see some sort of implementation to have kind of an AI building out the regions that are empty as the game goes. Again, this is more just kind of thinking through things as opposed to actually having realistically experienced any issues. Going back to the two-player account, I think that you might have the same issue there as well, that same exact aspect. And you can say, well, two players is more balanced. You have two empty regions. 
Sure, but there's no guarantee as to who winds up with the empty region at any given point based on how things turn. You can turn it one way, getting the empty region, start developing, then turning right back, and now you have the empty region again. So empty regions at all can kind of mess up the sense of progression of equalizing across the regions. I don't know it's an issue, but it certainly does mess up the equalize, equalizing of it. As far as what I like, don't like, and can see I was not liking. Starting off with the fact that there's multiple pathways towards victory. There's a whole bunch of different ways towards trying to get points in this game. A ton of ways, both in-game points, which are important, especially as it's important because it gives you more workers, as well as end-game points. End-game points as well are going to be chunks of points from here to the giant regions over here. Additionally, one aspect that I didn't touch upon is the fact that whenever players are tied over here, they're not going to get any of the points, and it's going to go down to the next player below them, so that's always... Well, I mean, it depends on who you are. It may or may not be fun or frustrating. There's going to be points for how you score over here. There's going to be points for trade cards. There's going to be objectives. I didn't even talk about the objectives. The fact that you're going to have these starting game objectives and possibly the ability to swap them out as the game goes on, depending on what cards come up. You're going to be choosing some of those, and that can give you chunks of points as well. And so there's a lot of opportunities to try to figure out the best way to get points in this game. And you're going to want to heavily focus on some of those while kind of drifting into others. Uh, the last game I played, I didn't have a single worker down here at all, but I leaned heavily into the Senate over here, and I had a little bit of building up my little tableau over here, and then starting to drift towards that collection. So I had one thing I was really good at, and then two things I was kind of dabbling in while completely ignoring this region, because to a certain degree, you'll want to stay in your lane. If you can't compete well in a certain genre, then maybe just skip it entirely. So there's a lot of different options there as far as how to progress towards victory, and the chunk of points you get at the end of the game is not insignificant. You can, your score can potentially double, it depends on how well you did endgame, but your score can potentially double at the end of the game, giving you a large chunk of points in the game in terms of swinging things entirely so you have to focus both on the in-game progression to get those workers to keep things moving to earn points as well as the end game progression because that will give you that chunk at the end and it's a fun balance that in-game aspect of trying to figure out when to trade in points versus not is important because unlike a normal game or normal is a relative term but unlike some games where trading in points for resources is more of a how much i want to get going in this engine in this game until you've unlocked all your workers trading in points is also halting your in-game engine giving up points now might mean that you don't get that extra worker for another turn or two so you have to think about how many points you're going to get back what's the conversion what are you going to end up getting is this going to pay for itself within a turn or two because if it doesn't then it may just not be worthwhile and so that's another factor as you try to trade in points and you figure out the balance of when to do that and there's lots of opportunities to kind of pounce on the moment based on the way the board's turning. Every single round, you're going to reveal a card, and that, that card's going to tell you which way the board is turning, whether it's going completely, that double layer over here, whether it's going completely to the opposite region entirely. And that does mean that you have the option or the, the planning aspect of seeing what's coming your way. You might see that, oh, hey, this level two building over here is approaching. So if I manage to build up 16 money, which is not an easy thing to do, but you potentially can do so if you work at it. If I'm willing to build up six money, 16 money, as this moves to my region, I'll be able to build that third level building. I'll get that medallion or the medal or whatever it is and get that extra perk associated with that action. And so there's a lot of opportunities to see what's coming and to plan around it, to think through how many workers you have, which action spots are coming your way, what did the player who's you know pivoting it towards you, what did they build or not build this round? There's a lot of chances to think that through, as well as turn order. You'll understand that the turn order of next round as well. And that means you can sit there and try to think through how you place your workers this round. Do I place my worker in my sun at last in order to get one more thing on the top? So that next round, I can start it off quickly and add in a bonus action, placing two over here and scoring six points all in one shot. There's a lot of things you can do as you try to think through and anticipate, not really anticipate, but see directly what's coming your way and plan around that. And earning points in this game is just so satisfying. I don't have an easy way to explain it, but there's something fun about just getting those little points, about moving up the track. And that's true of all games, but something about the engine you're building, about the way you build your buildings down, of the way you get a little points here, a few points here, maybe because it just feels like you worked hard for them, but locking in those extra points, moving up the track, placing down a building, getting six more points, and slowly progressing up, earning additional workers. Maybe it's just the workers. Maybe I just want more workers, and that's why I find it so satisfying. But whatever it is, I do find find it satisfying to take those actions that slowly creep you up. The first round of the game, you move up four points, five points. The second round, you move up a little further. Maybe you get your third worker on the second round, maybe if you're planning it well. And you slowly push and pull, giving up points to get money, using that money to gain back your points. There's a fun little engine at play here. But there are things I don't like as well, which is a good time to jump into those. And starting off with the fact that the asymmetric factions heavily push a dominant, fa da dominant strategy on you. All the players come in asymmetric. They come in with different abilities, different starting money, different starting points, different starting schemes, a whole bunch of different things going on as far as the players. But 
the way the bonus markers are laid out. See, every player has bonus markers, something we didn't talk about, but the idea that you can use these bonus markers to take stronger actions of certain actions. You can go in the Zenith and get two votes at once instead of one. Now, you can only do that once per round per bonus marker, but you can unlock a bunch of bonus markers as you progress, as you send your schemes towards other players. And so using those bonus markers are great, except it does kind of put you in a situation where all the players have a starting bonus marker that's available to them, and if you don't lean heavily in, like that first round of play, that first round of play, you're going to have two workers at best. If you perfectly plan it, you'll have two workers, you'll get your stuff done, and that's great. And if you have a bonus marker available to you, your two actions effectively become three. You'll get 50% more done that first turn if you pursue the strategy that the game pushes on you. I haven't tried not doing that. I haven't seen any of the players I've played with not do that. Every single time I play this game, everyone has leaned into the strategy that the game gave them. And while you can absolutely branch out as the game progresses, that's absolutely true. As the game progresses, you'll pursue other things, you'll do other stuff, you'll move your modus markers out more, you'll start getting a little more flexibility as the game goes. But there generally is something that each character is better at, and I think if you neglect that thing, I think you will struggle in this game. I'm saying I think because I haven't actually tried not doing so, because like I said already, no one I've played with has tried not doing so. It just seems so strong to give that up, and that means that it means that while the game gives you a lot of choice to a certain degree, a lot of choices also thrust upon you by the character you pick. Now, you could solve for that to a degree by drafting characters, by picking characters, and having the agency in the character selection before you even start, and you also have the agency as far as how you augment the thing. And I'm not saying the game has no agency, I'm just saying that the big part of your starting power is foisted upon you when the game begins. Additionally, the empty regions are player counts. We kind of touched upon that during player order, but that's something that feels a little off at lower player counts having empty regions. And then points in some areas feel a bit disproportionate. Now, this does depend on how players do things and what they go for, but you can work really hard getting a whole bunch of actions to build that up, and you might get at maximum like 13, 14 points for every single thing. Versus if you're able to lock in some strong rounds at the Senate, you might get nine points in a single turn as opposed to across the whole game. And so there are times where points in different regions and points in different strategies feel a bit disproportionate. Set collection in the game. Gathering sets of cards and locking them down, again, could be a ton of work hoping and driving forward that you hopefully get the right sets, which you may or may not. Now, granted, you can turn those cards in for other actions, but it, it can be a lot of fishing around for the right cards for the right sets, and you do have a hand limit in play that will limit you, and so the points can feel disproportionate in different strategies. I'm not confident in this yet, but it does feel some strategies are a little bit better than others. But then lastly, and my biggest pet peeve, I think the, the others are, are factors that are factors, the things I don't like, but they're not that big a deal for me. The one that is a big deal for me is the fact that this game gives you a bunch of different pathways and they don't really connect at all. Building out your thing, going down over here, going for votes in the Senate, those are all their own little engines. They have nothing to do with the rest of the interweaving connections of the game. Now the Senate, you could argue, because this gives you points during the game, it does have a little bit of a connection as far as how you get, how quickly you get additional workers. So sure, a drop of a connection there. The trade cards are going to be the biggest area where you have a lot of connections with other things because of the fact that they give you tons of abilities. So they give you different things when you go here, when you do this, get that stuff. So these definitely do interact with the rest of the game, making this action the most exciting action. The other actions are all important. I'm not saying they're not important, but they tend to focus very heavily on the end game and have no real consequence to the other things. I wish this game had a bit more inter interconnectivity between the different ways you can generate points and between the ways you can augment those things to have some impact on other areas of the game. As you build these out, you have just the Senate over here. As you go down here for the area control, you have an impact on far, as far as how the board moves or some other different thing. I don't have any firm ideas. I just wish that the game had a lot more interconnectivity between the different tracks so that it felt a bit more nuanced as opposed to simply choose one strong track, choose a few weak tracks, and go from there. Again, the trade cards have that. Trade cards absolutely have that interconnectivity, but it's the only one of the pathways forward that really strongly has that. The rest are just entities unto themselves. The game works, the game gives you a pathway forward, the game gives you all these aspects to consider, and you have to balance the endgame scoring, but the in-game aspect, those are, I, I want a little bit more interactiveness from those things. As far as what I can see being a problem for you, few small things. First of all, the luck around the turning board. This relates a little bit to the to the empty region, although I'm referring to even at a four player count, you might have aspects of the fact that, well, you got the board that, you know, shifted to you, that had the building you can utilize from, and you had this moving that way, and I had this moving this way, you had that scheme adjusted to you, I was trying to pass you a scheme, and no matter how many times you the board just kept going back and forth, and so I couldn't give it to you. There is potential luck around the way the board turns. It hasn't bothered me significantly, but it's something that might be a little bit 
frustrating as far as the board turns. And it doesn't turn with regularity, it turns based on those cards, which can genuinely result, hypothetically speaking, you can have an entire region of the board that just never shifts to another player. I mean, it'll shift, but it won't shift. Like, this region may never go to this player. That can happen. Has it happened? I don't think so, but it certainly can just because of the way the cards come up. Uh, set diving. Set diving is going to be another degree of luck in the game that, again, could bother you. The fact that you have a hand limit of five cards, and depending on which character you start with, you may even start with an anchor card that you have to get rid of, so until you do, you'll only have four cards. And if a set of cards needs to be three cards, and the game requires that you get rid of cards before you draw new cards, you can't draw above your hand limit and discard down. You have to simply discard down then draw to your hand limit, that means diving for the right set can be frustrating. It doesn't bother me because all the cards give you abilities, so what I do is I just focus on the fact that I want a yellow set, and then I just go for that, and any cards that don't cater to the yellow set, I use for their action instead, or you can sell for money at any given time, although that tends to be a worse return. So it doesn't particularly bother me, but there certainly is luck of the draw over there. And then lastly, the game does have a little bit of the rich can get richer. Now, the game has a few catch mechanics in place, but I don't think they operate that well, which might be a good thing for you, it might be a bad thing, depending on your opinions on catch mechanics. We have these cards over here that tend to give the, every round you tend to give some points or money or something to the players who have the least of something. The problem is the least of something is a situational thing, it's not necessarily guaranteed to actually be that meaningful. You could have the least of any number of things that are temporary as opposed to a permanent thing, and so it doesn't necessarily reward the person who's doing poorly, it just rewards random people to a certain extent. Uh, additionally, you have that aspect of of the, the rich getting richer, the fact that as this, this catch up mechanic over here, that as these move down, the next player has an easier time getting an additional worker. That's nice, it does help a little bit, but it's not so much a catch up mechanic as it is slightly making it easier so that the gap doesn't get further and further, but it doesn't have that meaningful an impact, especially if someone's further behind. And then you have this aspect, especially when it comes to the Senate over here, where very often a player who's strongly going for the Senate, especially if that player is doing well, will be continuously powering through, trying to get as many points as possible, slotting in three at a time, three at a time, three at a time, and other players might have to choose to give up an action to stop that person, even though it might be an action that doesn't help them. Them. So you, you have all these small little aspects where I have seen in games where a player who's doing very well can just ha be hard for other players to catch up or meaningfully stop them in any way. Again, that might be a good thing or a bad thing. It doesn't bother me because I found it only really happens when you're playing with new players. Uh, once you get people up and running, once they know the game, I find that some of those aspects do self-balance. But it does have that, at least at first. As far as final thoughts on Age of Rome, this has gone on for a decent amount of time, but as far as final thoughts on Age of Rome... There are many aspects of Age of Rome that I particularly enjoy, that I find very satisfying. The way you build up the points, the way you build up the regions, the way you lay these acrylic tiles slowly but surely on the board. I do wish the acrylic tiles had a bit more uh, aspects as far as laying, layering down different levels on top of one another. The first level looks very nice, but the second and third level just kind of sit there. I mean, they, they do the job, but side point. But either way, there's a lot of aspects of Age of Rome that are very rewarding. There are a lot of aspects that are very satisfying. There are a lot of different things that are going on. For me, my biggest pet peeve is the fact that I just, I like a certain degree of crunchiness to my Euro, and while I think this is a great game, I think it's an easy game I can recommend, it also is being recommended with the caveat that I, I personally want it to be a little higher. I personally want it to give you a little bit more interactivity. I want it to be, I don't know what their plans are for the Kickstarter, I wish there was some expansion or something that in some way made these elements connect differently, that some way gave you a little bit more to think about in the game. As it stands, the game is fun, the game is satisfying, I just want that little bit more crunchiness for myself. Uh, this one's a 3.5 out of 5 for me. Uh, it's beautiful production, a lot of fun things going on, I think you will enjoy it and have a good time, I think especially, I think it falls into a solid gateway plus category, while I want Want it to be, I guess, gateway plus plus for myself. As far as other game recommendations, oh, and I probably said this at the beginning, but this is a prototype. Definitely should have said that at the beginning. This is a prototype. Uh, all rules, components, everything else subject to change, especially given the fact that many of the things you're seeing over here are not the way you're going to see it on the Kickstarter. Many of the printing aspects are not fully, fully there. Definitely should have said that at the beginning of this video. As far as other game recommendations, other game recommendations, we have Lords of Waterdeep. Lords of Waterdeep will also give you a degree of worker placement and building up buildings and having a little bit of a just a lighter, gateway accessible a worker placement game. And if you want to escalate it up a bit in terms of the little degree of meanness that that Age of Rome brings to the table, Carson City is going to be a great recommendation. Again, has that aspect of worker placement, of putting buildings on the board, of developing the board in a way that all players can use it in different ways, although using it there can be a bit meaner. But while having that different degree of meanness, instead of schemes, you have duels and different aspects going on in Carson City. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. You can check out this game over on Kickstarter. There'll be a link down below. As always, have a good one.